Hey folks, this is Bob Ferguson, and I'm here today with my friend, Susan Crumdike. Susan is the department chair. Well, Susan, tell me, tell, tell us what your title is, because I, I never get it right. <laughs> right, well, I, I'm a professor of mechanical engineering for 20 some years, and I have taken a position in Scotland at Harriet Watt University as a chair in energy transition engineering. Very good. And what you're up to is not simply uh, sitting in the ivory tower. You're actually on to a very, very, very important program that the British government is funding. So what would that be? Right. Well, I am the academic lead on the Island Center for Net Zero. So this is a government funded um, proposition. They're putting 16 and a half million pounds into about five years work um, to uh, actually transition the islands of Orkney, Shetland, and Outer Hebrides to net zero by 2030. So the impetus has been to actually do things to change what needs changing. And so that makes it very interesting. There's been a lot of um, uh, pathways and scenarios and things like that. But the actual doing is is where we um, where we now need to apply what we've learned. So that that's pretty exciting that that's where we're at at the coal front and working with these um, remote communities um, on actual change. Well, that is very, very thrilling because if we're going to get done what we need to get done, then we need to be about it, right? We need to be about right. doing the figuring out and the doing, which is really what we talked about in part one of this series is what is transition engineering? Or first of all, what is a wicked problem that transition engineering can be used to solve? And it's pretty nice, pretty good. So this time I've asked you, Susan, to talk about your notion, which was really remarkable when I read the transition engineering book, the idea of energy return on investment. Most of us are familiar with return on investment or things like gross national product and economic terms that come from a particular perspective on the world. If we have a particular perspective, then we build our systems around those perspectives and our systems create our results, results create our world and what we're living in right now. It's pretty clear that something needs to change, right? We're pretty handily cooking the planet. There's inequity all around. And I think there's general confusion about what is worth pursuing and what is not worth pursuing. And as we've spoken of in the past, it's not if you're pursuing something that actually thermodynamically can't work, it just can never work. So you can put as much money in right. as you want, it can't work. Then- That's just fraud. <laughs> well, you're basic, you're basic fraud. Um, but even, even if you don't think it's fraud, you know, it just being able to have the mechanism for understanding, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, whether something can make sense. And the problem is if you're working on prob on, on solutions that aren't solutions that can't make sense thermodynamically, then you're just putting off working on the things that can make sense, that do make sense, that will actually create the change. At least that's my layman's interpretation uh, of, of what I understand from you. So let's dive in and we'll call this thing a change in perspective. Well, that, that's, what, that's what we'll call this episode. So Talk to us about the perspective of energy return on investment. And then next time we'll do a little bit of myth busting. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, the energy return on energy invested came um, from quite some time ago, the 70s or so out of um, ec ecology. So not economics or anything, but um, ecologists were looking at um, uh, closed systems, and Charlie Hall is one of the one of the main authors that you'll find um, around this topic. Um, and there, a uh, famous study, he looked at a pond, a freshwater pond, and was looking at all of the species in that pond. And the pond was kind of isolated, so it's not like there was a lot of nutrients flowing in and other things flowing out. Um, and so he's just wondering, you know, how does the food cycle work in, in here? And he started looking at different species 
seem to be spending different amounts of time in the pursuit of their food. And if you think about that, it, it's kind of true, isn't it? Like hummingbirds just continuously looking for food and using lots and lots of energy. And uh, reptiles sitting for very long periods of time without even moving. And um, so that idea of that all species sim have to expend some energy in getting their food, whether they're um, hunters or prey or you know, vegetarian or whatever, uh, like bears that'll eat anything. Um, and the interesting question is, well, um, you know, some of some animals seem to really not be putting in much effort to get the, the food that they need and others spend all their time doing it and um, essentially come down to the burn rate. So if you if you burn a lot of food, then you have to continuously look for food. Um, so that that makes sense. That's the uh, energy in equals energy out. Um, the question then is what um, what if you're like us as humans and you can make choices about what you put energy into? How would you know if you're getting um, enough energy back um, to you know to pay back that investment? And um, so in the two thousands. Um, somebody did a, a look at oil, so the production of oil. So how much energy does it take, you know, like embedded in the, in the machines that you use in the exploration and the drilling and the, and the pumping and the refining and the um, driving around. So, so how much energy do we actually have to expend to get you know, a the energy in a liter of fuel um, at the tank? And what they found was that if you went back to the beginning of the oil boom, um, it looked like you got about a hundred barrels of oil for, for every barrel of oil's worth of energy that you put in. That is a great deal. <laughs> um, but then what they found was as you, as you look through the data um, over the last uh, hundred years or so, especially the last 80 years, that's where they had reasonable data, um, you saw that that return on investment has been dropping. And from the 70s, when the, the Arab oil embargo happened and the US went all the way to Alaska to look for oil and then went offshore, went out into the ocean floating around to get oil, um, the, the ret that energy return on energy invested has, has really been dropping to the point where um, you know now, when you look at something like tar sands or fracking, that return on investment is, is definitely below 10. So we went from, you know, one uh, put, invest a, a barrel of oil, get 100 back, to invest a barrel of oil, get 10 back. And like I said, the, the fracking and the, um, and, and the tar sands are, are probably even less than that. Some, some studies are showing more like three or something. So then the question becomes, well, um, does that matter? <laughs> Right. What I mean, as long as it's cheap, you know, and what you also see is, th is that there's definitely a correlation. The higher the, e um, the EROI, the lower cost the fuel and um, the lower the EROI, the higher cost the fuel. So energy return on energy invested, we, we shorten that to EROI, we say EROI. <laughs> um, so that study then of, well, OK. Um, you know, we, we seem to really only base the metrics for for is it worth it to go get oil, say, in the Arctic or any other strange place, um, how much it costs to do it, how big of a mess we make. Um, we only seem to base that on very short term questions of profit. And so the this area that um, I myself and, and many other researchers have been looking into is, well, you know how economics provides um, sort of a basis, the economic analysis, the, you know, am I, am I going to get a good return on the investment? Um, what are the risks? Th those sorts of analysis are there to help make a decision really. Um, once you make the decision, you're in, it flops or it, or it goes, you know, who knows, but, but at some point you make a decision and, and you also convince um, investors to invest in, in that um, venture. 
So if we could understand um, the energy basis, could we also inform the, the, that kind of decision making? So this field of looking at the return on investment, um, thinking of energy return on investment um, it is called biophysical economics. Let's just, um, it's called that because um, it works in the biosphere and it works in the physical world. So they call it biophysical economics. <laughs> So I hope that gets us started in understanding that we're we're looking for a metric that keeps account takes an keeps an account of um, how much energy we're having to spend to get energy, and we're thinking that that would be a good way to inform whether it's worth it um, to go after certain you know the the next kind of energy. Does that make sense? Yep, yeah, I will. absolutely makes sense. Uh, yep. Yeah. I'm not a technical guy, but that makes some level of intuitive sense from my own experience. So I think you have a couple of slides that you can bring up sure. from the course that you did that will help us get into the weeds on this. Because again, we're going to use this analysis the next time we get together, maybe next Sunday, <laughs> and talk about using this particular way of analyzing the return on, on energy, uh, return from energy that you use to create the energy, right? Uh, whether it makes sense, whether, whether things that are kind of bandied about on uh, LinkedIn, on the internet, or even in research labs or funded by the governments, uh, do they make sense? And uh, it's gonna be, that's gonna be fascinating, but let's, let's get the basis for actually analyzing that. All right. so. We're going to go ahead and get geeky on energy return on energy invested here, EROI, um, but we're going to do it with pictures so it's not going to be too painful. <laughs> and I have put together here basically the overall energy return on energy invested of our energy system in the year 2000. It looks like that energy return on energy invested is about 20. So for every 100 units of energy produced, so that's where P there, the energy production, it requires about five units of energy from the economy in order to be able to produce those 100 units. So that means that the economy gets 95 units of energy to do whatever it wants with. Um, we consume the vast majority of the 95, so about, let's call it 60 units of every 100 are consumed. So that's our um, heating for our homes, our um, driving around, our flying on vacation. So yeah, consumed. And then we need to expend energy into the maintenance of the stuff we've already got, right? So, so paving, uh, patching the roads, um, uh, maintaining buildings, machines, cars, etc. And then um, whatever's left, the, the spare um, we can use to grow and to build new things. So uh, new, new objects, new houses, new roads. And um, it looks like the balance is somewhere around this for, for, for the, the 2000s. Now I will say that that 10 is not big enough. The, the the little bit that was going into maintenance, we all know that through the 2000s, we weren't spending enough on maintaining our bridges and roads and, um, and built environment. And so, so we're, um, we're sort of, uh, <laughs> we've got a backlog of maintenance now, but that's the general idea. So, so do you understand that, that flow of energy into the economy and then, then what you do with it in the economy? And as you can see, um, with an energy return on investment of about 20, the energy production sector itself is a pretty big sector. It requires five units from the economy in order to be able to deliver the energy that we're using. Um, so, you know, it's, it's almost as big as what we spend on maintenance to produce the energy, but it's not a huge drag on the economy. It's, it's manageable. So an EROI of 20, um, you can have some growth and lots and lots of consumption. Do you agree? <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right. Um, so that, uh, that's our main thing to keep in mind. And what I thought I'd do is to just have some fun looking at history and um, 
seeing what, you know, we, we understand our own way of living and our own economy and our own, uh, how we use energy, but, but what about other people in other times and other ways of living? So if you, uh, if you go on, um, there's a, a, a lot of study. So, so academics who look at, um, that level of return on investment, if you've got more than 20, return on investment, then you definitely have some surplus and you can have some growth. You can have specialized labor. You can have higher education, research, arts. You can have um, a very small minority of your population engaged in actually producing the things that everybody is using. So you can have, have uh, very few farmers and uh, manufacturers and that, and lots of service industry. So, so that's sort of the EROI greater than 20. Um, but if you go down to 10, it's really hard to grow. There isn't enough surplus to, to grow. And conservation is the only way to free up resources to do maintenance um, or to um, uh, build anything new. So um, with the EROI around 10, you need a lot more people in primary production. Um, and then with the EROI less than 10, you, uh, you're, you're having degrowth. You, um, you have failures of systems and contraction and collapse um, of, the, of the, the complex society. And 80% of the population has to be engaged in primary production and processing, essentially you know, making, making whatever or, and growing whatever that they need. So that energy from outside the system, us using it replaces a lot of, um, a lot of the primary production energy that, um, that we might need. So, so just when we, when we pick an energy source that we want, we want one uh, that we want to develop, we want one with a really high EROI because <laughs> that's sort of how we got the way we are. <laughs> it's because we got that. So yeah, that trip through history. Are you ready for that? Ready to go. All right. Um, so let's go way back, right? So the um, uh, maybe Stone Age sort of time, or maybe Iron Age even. Um, well, let's not go to Iron Age because the Stone Age, you needed fuel for processing, but but it would be pottery. So you would you would get a really high temperature and fire pottery maybe, um, and but it would last a really long time. So the energy required in manufacturing and processing wasn't too high. You, you could use fire for smoking to preserve food. You definitely use it for cooking. Um, and so the question then, what's, what's the energy return on energy invested? Because food is also the primary energy, the, the actual food that you get. So you, you had to band together and... Um, uh, uh, if you were going if you wanted protein food, <laughs> you can also, um, you know, go to the bounty where you are. This, this picture there is me in a, a Pacific Island called Rotuma, quite a ro remote Pacific Island. And the folks there, um, in the morning go out with a net and collect the fish for the day. Um, they go out to the, the plants around the house and pick the fruit for the day and um, dig up some taro. And, and it takes about two and a half coconut husks to cook the taro for the day. Um, and and that's, you know, that's the energy input um, that you need. Um, and the rest of the day, you can um, hang out, <laughs> which you don't wanna to move too much because this, this island is right at the equator and it's, it's very hot. So they use the shade during the day and then do the do the work that needs doing once the the sun goes down or or in the very early morning before the sun comes up the the washing and the sweeping, um, building that sort of thing. Um, so it looks like just you know there's been there's been different calculations and it looks like the energy return on energy invested of this way of life is quite high. You have a lot of free time. And you don't have a lot of stuff, so you know you you don't need to, to spend a lot of time accumulating or or taking care of your stuff. Um, and uh, you also don't have growth. So if you if you think about it, um, this little island, people have been living there. The archaeologists reckon for about three thousand years. 
Um, and the population has been relatively stable. Um, they haven't uh, they haven't consumed the island in that time. They um, build and then rebuild. Um, there's no inflation because you know you're. Um, it, it, it's okay. There's no need for inflation if there's if there's no scarcity. So so you don't have that, and you, you don't really have waste. In other words, if you went out and picked a pawpaw. Um, you wouldn't just throw half of it on the ground. <laughs> you you don't waste what what you what you bring in. So that's um, that's sort of a way that humans lived for tens of thousands of years. And so um, you know it's sort of no wonder that it was successful and um, and humanity continued to thrive and go about their business. So the next stage is when we get new materials and new ways of um, of organizing ourselves. So it's pretty clear that hunter gatherers knew very well agriculture that they, that's not, it's not that they didn't know that it's just that that wasn't their way of life. So they would definitely have been um, like like those folks were in Rotuma they would have their you know their trees that they're taking care of that that have good fruit and they would they would uh, understand grains and probably weed patches of pumpkins and things like that. So so it isn't that they they weren't um, engaged in agriculture or in in interacting with animals in a in a husbandry sort of way. It's just that they didn't build buildings and stay in one place all the time and rely only on on their own agriculture. Um, so once people started doing that, um, it would be also when they started um, using a lot more wood and using energy sources like water and wind. Um, they would use wind for travel. And they were using animal labor um, a lot and, and human labor. So the energy in is the food for the beasts and for the people. The wood in to, um, to process materials um, and um, you know, to make metals. It takes a lot of energy to, to, to make a metal material. Um, but you would have used it for a really long time too. So still not a lot of waste. Not a lot of growth, but you could um, actually accumulate enough surplus to build some pretty impressive things, and that's that's um, uh, what uh, you know the stuff that survives from from this uh, from agricultural era. era um, we'll go look at the standing stones of Stinnis is is just down the road from me. Um, you know some of the first settled um, agricultural um, people. Uh, four, 5,000 years ago, um, built some big things. So they had some time on their hands. They could go collect giant stones and drag them across the island and, and stick them up. And here, here they are still there. Um, so they can build monumental things, um, but still the everyday person's lifestyle didn't, didn't um, require, again, a closet. <laughs> um, and, and you didn't need a lot of space for your stuff. But people were very good at making the stuff that they made and it would last for a long time. And um, we know that the artisanry of this, uh, of, of these sort of people is quite high. Their efficient, efficiency isn't good. Um, their water wheels weren't very efficient. Um, the, the, they don't have insulation very, very much. Um, their plows were horribly inefficient. Um, so their, their energy efficiency wasn't great, but their energy return on investment was, was fine. And again, not much inflation, not much, not much growth, extremely slow growth. Um, so when, when the energy source is muscle, wood, and water. Um, and this is what that society looks like. So, so um, the total world energy consumption in 1250 AD, that's the medieval period, um, was 50 million tons of oil equivalent. That's what that measure is. Um, today, in our world, it's 9,000 million tons of oil equivalent. So we use a lot more energy than, than um, they did in, in 1250. Um, the EROI is, is fine. It, it, works, it works fine. Um, but you can see there's a little bit bigger drag on, on the economy because of the energy uh, required to get the energy you need, which again, like we said, is, is actually all the food um, for the labor and, and, and the wood. Now let's also remember that when we go to collect wood, we consume that energy. So like in heat and cooking, but let's also understand that when you cook food, 
it really increases the efficiency of you being able to um, process it. So, um, so that's it. It sort of increases um, uh, the the benefit of or the efficiency of how you can use that food energy in in muscles. Um, all right. So that's uh, we also of course have have windmills and water wheels um, at, at this time. All right. So if we go forward a bit more, um, oh, I just gave you a nice um, a nice graph. <laughs> This is the, the use of, of um, energy and the types of energy over time. Uh, the, the data I found goes back to 1860. So we were just talking about 1200s. And what you'll see is that that 50 million tons of oil equivalent, it didn't grow very fast for centuries. It, it's about the same um, until we get to coal. And then coal starts coming in and, um, and you can now have machines do work, not just people and beasts. And that is a, is a huge change. And that huge change is a long time ago. It's in the 1860s. Um, now, it, by the 1860, that uh, consumption is 100 million tons of oil equivalent, and the EROI is still quite good. It's over 20. So um, you can see what's coming in the future. <laughs> Of course, they couldn't at the time. But if we go on, what, do the, what does our arrow diagram look like for that era? I think I made us an arrow diagram. So go for it. Oh, just to remind you, what, what is society like in the, in the uh, mid-1800s? Um, we're burning a lot of coal, and that's uh, coal and wood, of course, still using wood. Um, but um, with coal, now you can use um, the heat energy from coal in heat engines instead of horses. So you can do more things. The return on investment is still a, is, is quite high. The efficiency is still very bad. So efficiency of 10%, what does that mean? Well, a, a modern heat engine, the efficiency is, is more like 40%. So um, the technology was just... Uh, you know, early, <laughs> all the, well, they didn't have engineering schools per se and, and uh, modeling to work on getting efficiency higher and all that. Um, but we've got a lot of new things that we're using energy for, uh, machines to make textiles instead of hands, chemicals, metals, lots of metal in this system, ceramics, bricks, um, lighting, heat. There was a lot of building going on in the mid 1800s um, and a lot of, of production. Um, by the 1860s, we still had 80% of people working in primary production, though, fishing, um, farming, that sort of thing. All right, so moving on in time. Uh, by 1950, I don't know, if you look at the graph um, of energy, world energy use, something happens in the 1950s. You can see that coal um, had already taken off and it, it continues to grow, but not the same way that something else does, and that's oil and natural gas. Um, so in the 1950s, we had about 60% um, uh, coal uh, in the energy that was used, and that was in industry um, and power, power generation. Um, but now we're starting to drive <laughs> and fly, and we're starting to have big military activities. So that's, that's where a lot of the oil goes. All right, and now by the 1950s, we're up to 2,000 million tons of oil equivalent, and the EROI is probably the highest it will ever be in human history, okay? So that um, very efficient coal use um, and oil um, that is very easy to find. So this is, this is the, uh, the, the really high return on investment oil. Um, pushes the ERI over 50. So let's see what that does to our little blue arrow diagram. Um, we're now up at 2,000 million tons of oil equivalent. The economy is not actually consuming that much energy, but it is building things like crazy. <laughs> And the energy sector is taking almost no energy from the economy. So the economy turns out can't even figure out that energy isn't just free. And that is the basis for our economic system is a system that's based on free 
very high quality energy. It just is flowing in basically the same way air turns up. <laughs> it just it just arrives. And the economy can't even use it. There's so much of it that that it's more than what we needed. And so we come up with new ways to use it. Uh, we have uh, in the 1950s, I don't know if, if any if you've ever been in a house that was designed in the 1950s, um, the closet space is very tiny. And now you need his walk-in closet and her walk-in closet. So since the 50s, the idea that you needed, um, you know, uh, well, in the 50s, we know that people would buy a new outfit for each season. So maybe four a year, yeah. Um, and now we're at more than one, more than one a week. So we're, we're just really consuming um, in a, in a, at a crazy rate compared to, to then. And if you look around where you live, look at how much of where you live actually existed in 1950. And you'll see that, yeah, there's been some sprawl, but an awful lot of the, the actual core of the city, um, your, your football stadium, you know, um, in the 50s is when that was getting built. The 50s and the 60s were an absolute growth um, uh, anomaly. But the economics that was derived to try and figure out what was going on and to say, look, whatever's going on now, we want that to keep going and we don't ever want to have what happened in the 30s happen again. Remember, everybody around in the 50s who was an economist would have remembered the 1930s Great Depression. And so this idea that growth itself is the miracle that keeps the depression monster away. <laughs> That's where it came from because we had this period of absolutely unprecedented, unimaginable growth. And that seemed like we were very clever. <laughs> well, actually we found oil and um, got into full gear of using it. All right, so the 1950s, don't forget, crazy time. <laughs> and then we move on, and now we're, we want to come into the 1970s, so like when, when, when mum was around, right? The 1970s. Um, we are now up to 5,000 million tons of oil equivalent world um, energy consumption. And um, we're just about to run into a problem, and that is that the oil system is going to, or the oil supply is going to take a hiccup. So you see that that uh, downward fall there. That was the OPEC oil embargo, so a politically motivated um, shutdown of energy supply, uh, oil supply, um, and that was probably. Um, a huge turning point in EROI um, because then um, the United States and other countries went looking for oil in places that weren't the really high EROI, easy to get oil. So the EROI is still very high in the early 70s. We're using energy like gangbusters. So let's see what that looks like in our, um, our little diagram. Because remember the 60s, the 50s and 60s um, growth boom um, embedded energy use in our lives because we built all these things that need energy, right? Um, the, the airports, the roads, especially the roads, because that's how we're going to be able to consume all that oil is we're going to have roads everywhere and cars everywhere. Um, so let's go into the, the blue arrow for the 1970s. And we'll see that we now have a very large consumption. Um, and it is, like I said, it, all the growth that you had in the 50s and 60s was locking in consumption, bigger houses, more houses, skyscrapers, big buildings, um, giant university campuses. So we're locking in a huge amount of energy use uh, by design. And that stuff is all pretty new still in the 70s. So it doesn't really need that much maintenance. And so we get used to not really having to maintain things, which is why the economic system that builds in uh, um, the discount rate. So, so you look into the future and an expense for maintenance in the future is tiny because of the way the net present value is calculated. It just says, oh, don't worry about stuff in the future because we're going to keep growing forever because this is the way our economy is supposed to work. 
uh, not that old 1800s way, definitely not that 1930s way. This is us. This is us. There's nothing else but this. <laughs> and funny enough, that um, party doesn't require a lot of maintenance. So we, we sort of got used to that. And in the 70s, like we said, that the energy return, energy invested was huge. And so we don't have a lot of um, drag on the economy from the energy sector. But this is all about to change. So let's go on to, oh, don't forget, we had a huge military buildup. So now we're going to look a little closer at um, where we are in the 2000s. So this is the turn of the century. We'd gotten up to... Uh, 10,000 million tons of oil equivalent consumption um, and an EROI now of 20. So yeah, going to Alaska, going into the Gulf, going offshore, um, those are much lower EROI than Saudi Arabia and um, Texas and Pennsylvania where, where the oil was first found. Um, so um, off we go, this is us. And let's see what our um, blue arrow looks like, our blue arrow diagram. All right, so there we are, a society with an energy return of investment of, um, of 20 um, and nine, 10,000 million tons of oil equivalent um, per year being used. And we see that we have now, compared to previous human history, massive, massive consumption. And I'm going to show you why it is not possible to continue that consumption. That's the thing we have to know. You, you, uh, we might dream about getting uh, green sources of energy and getting those into the system, keeping the growth going. But you know what? We're, we're already, since 2000, starting to understand that the maintenance bill is coming due and that the, the growth just isn't what it used to be. And we're having a hard time with that story of growth forever. Um, which is one reason why the interest rates have, have squeezed down um, and the discount rates have also squeezed down. So, so people are sort of um, maybe, well, maybe the growth into the future isn't going to be as high as we thought it was going to be. <laughs> All right. So um, now we want to look into the future. What is worth doing? All right. So if we go forward, um, we can see that um, uh, our demand is now quite high, 14. Um, well, it's probably even higher than that. Well, who knows with COVID, right? <laughs> so um, before COVID, 14 million tons of oil equivalent. Um, we do see that China has, has grown a lot compared to what it used to have. Uh, rest of the world still growing. And everybody who was using lots and lots of energy has obviously locked in to using that much energy because they're continuing that. But the unconventional resources, their EROIs are much smaller. So let's go on um, another step here and see what that looks like. All right, a society that has an energy return on energy invested of five, which is what um, oil sands, um, shale gas, coal to liquids, Ammonia is way worse than this. It's actually negative. You get less energy out than what you than what you put in. So it's a it's an energy black hole. Hydrogen, huge black hole. <laughs> they're not energy sources. They're they're actually a drag on the economy. And we really need these diagrams <laughs> because they're not it, like they don't fit with a model of what an energy economy looks like. And I hope that this, this energy return on energy invested helps us understand that. Because even if we go to a five, not negative, like hydrogen and, and, um, and uh, carbon capture and storage brings you um, down below um, five. So um, what you've got here is what? Um, we're still producing 100 units of energy. But now the energy system itself, like, like the, the sources of energy, are requiring 20 units of energy in order to run. You remember we used to have 20 was our growth? Now that 20 is just going to the energy system, which isn't like making bread, it's just producing energy. <laughs> so I shouldn't say just, I mean, it's important, but we don't have then what? Well, you remember we said our consumption was 40. 
well, we can't do that anymore. We don't have it. And so our consumption starts to be squeezed. We, um, our maintenance bill has come due. We absolutely must maintain what we've got. We only designed for, for 30 to 50 years in our buildings and our, and our roads. Um, and so, you know, what are we going to do if, if your road isn't travelable? Um, <laughs> and yeah, so, so we have to do the maintenance, which means that there's nothing left for growth. So the end of growth uh, may very well not be a de decision that we make. It may, in fact, be the consequence of um, the reality of using very low energy return um, resources. All right. So if we go on, the story gets a little worse. <laughs> um, oh, I'm just reminding you that we used to have an EROI or consumption rate of 60, and we had to shrink that in order to um, to continue. So we've got a post peak decline, the total amount of energy is also going down. And so the future is looking like what so let's keep going <laughs> more. Uh, because uh, an EROI of two, which is something like what you what you would have, um, again, with say, blue carbon, where you're taking gas and um, turning it into the height or blue hydrogen, where you're turning it into hydrogen, and then pumping the CO2 into the ground. Um, the world would still be producing lots of CO2, but the energy system now is half the economy. And so we don't have the 60 to use anymore because we're only getting 50 units of energy to the economy. Um, we've got no energy for replacement and for maintenance. We don't have any energy for growth. And so this economy isn't looking great. And yet this um is what we're being told is the green option so this um <laughs> you know and, and of course we're trying to keep the energy consumption up so so we're gonna we're gonna keep trying to use um that twelve um, thousand million tons of oil equivalent in energy all right um if we move on a bit <laughs> um if we had this really bad energy um, decision to invest in very bad EROI um, resources so that half of our economy is just our energy production. Um, and we really shrank our consumption right down, then we might have enough for maintenance and replacement and we could kind of go on. Um, but we certainly don't have anything for growth. And so the ideas of a green economy are a very small consumption economy. Um, and that, you know, we're talking about a world that was designed for 60 units of consumption and it, it, it really can't have more than 30. So when I look forward, um, I'm looking at reduction in consumption, um, either to not produce the CO2 or because we made bad decisions on investing in low EROI um, energy technologies. So I'm, I'm planning to use less energy. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. And I'm working to design for less energy um, being needed. And that's that's energy transition right there. Either way you slice it. Now let's look at one more blue arrow diagram though. Because I really want to hit home that if I invest a barrel of oil and I get a barrel of oil back, right? An energy return on energy invested of one. There's too many people who think that's okay. Well, it broke even. Okay, hopefully you were understanding our blue arrow diagram <laughs> and you can understand that a economy with a energy system that returns a barrel of oil for a barrel of oil invested has no energy for the economy. <laughs> It only feeds the energy system. It, 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 you know, pulls a barrel of oil out of the ground, looks at it and puts it back into itself. It, it doesn't, it doesn't run the economy. So um, this metric of EROI, we, we can really start to understand that um, energy production systems with low EROI are what are they? Suicidal? They're, you can't make them work. And engineers will say that doesn't make sense. <laughs> That's what I mean by it doesn't make sense. Why would you do that? 
And maybe if you are an energy company and you're like, well, I don't care, you know, I'll still be doing my thing. Yeah, but the the economy isn't going to pay you to do it because they aren't getting anything for it. So, <laughs> yeah, so EROI of one, no, 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 no. That is collapsible. And what did we say that adding hydrogen onto your system, batteries onto your system, um, using you know, electric, electricity made methanol or e-fuels for your, for your um, airplanes, all of those are below one. <laughs> so, no, not a good idea. <laughs> all right, so did you get that? I got it, I'm sitting here going, okay, uh, okay. now what do we do? <laughs> But they're telling us, <laughs> well, I think I already hinted at that. And that is to take our high energy consumption and shrink that as fast as possible. Just do the transition engineering, do the energy transition. So energy transition is going from a high um, energy demand to a low, very, very low. And that, how do we, oh, actually there was one more. There is one more oh, slide there slide. that shows. Okay, all right. Um, um, what we call downshift. Okay, so, here we go. All right. Well, energy return on energy invested of 15 is um, decent. So let's, let's never go below that. So whatever your energy source is, ask, um, ask whoever is wanting to sell it to you. What is the energy return on energy invested? And if it's below 15, say, no, nope, bad deal. Don't want that. All right. So if we agree on that, that EROI of 15 is a requirement, then how do we fit into the low carbon world and um, a future world where there's energy to use? Remember, we're, we're using up the good EROI energy very quickly because it's finite, it's oil um, and gas, but oil. Oil's, oil's like um, patient zero for, <laughs> for good energy. Um, so what we need to do is reduce how much oil we produce. Um, reduce it by 80%. And that is what's required for climate stability as well. So we're looking at a total now of um, 4 million tons of oil, uh, or 4,000 million tons of oil equivalent. Um, we're looking at a decent uh, return on investment in the energy system. So you see seven units of the energy produced needs to go back to the energy sector. Um, and that gives us uh, 73, uh, uh, yeah, 73 units of energy to use, All right? Because um, we still need to do maintenance. So we need conservation on a massive scale. And where are we going to get the, uh, where are we going to get that conservation? By investing in whatever we will have for the next centuries. And I'm, uh, you know, we can design for three to four centuries. So let's do that that uses extremely small amount of energy. So we do have to take whatever energy we've got left and invest it in not needing energy. And that has to be done at a local scale. There is no energy solution. There's local retrofit, regeneration and reorganization so that you have very low maintenance requirements, you're not locked into high energy consumption and you will have the energy that you need because you don't need very much. Let's go over that graph one more time, just so okay. you can really understand what a livable future would actually look like. Let's take each one of those elements, talk about it again, so this really becomes very clear to people. All right. Um, so we've got a big downshift coming. And there's a period of transition where, um, the investment of the energy that we do have needs to go into retrofitting, regenerating, and reorganizing because the design of our cities and our supply chains and our food systems and our uh, the way we clothe ourselves, basically everything is designed for um, that 60 units of consumption. Um, and it needs to be downshifted to, to 20 units of consumption. Um, and I think, 
I really think that young people get that. I don't know if you've heard of things called tiny homes or, or frugality or simplicity. Um, we have overshot the benefit of having lots and lots of consumption. It's, it's not brought us the happiness that it seemed like it would. Now, why would we have thought that having, having high consumption would, would bring us happiness? Because having um, no consumption, like in the 30s and the Great Depression, was horrible. So we don't want to do that again. <laughs> But yeah, we, we uh, oil allowed a huge overshoot on the benefit um, of, of using energy. So that corrective step right now is the work of energy transition. Um, so we're, we essentially get the energy consumption um, down by two thirds by design. Uh, you might call it negative growth. I don't know what it is, is it is survival into the future. So yeah, we had that period of growth and we started saying growth a lot um, and it might look like degrowth, but it also might look more like retrofit and regeneration reorganization. So uh, the, the takeaway is that the only thing that makes sense is to use much less, 80% less of the good fuel we've got for consumption. That, that just, we, we can't be consuming that absolutely priceless one in a 10,000 year bounty <laughs> of fossil fuel. So fossil fuel has the high ROI that we can use to invest in the, the retrofit. Um, and it, 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 it's so valuable that it, we need to understand as, uh, what's essential and, and start using oil for that. So a big downshift in the, the amount of oil produced, um, that, um, that's why I call myself a heretic. <laughs> because it makes perfect sense if you look at the relationship between the energy sector and the economy, and you look at a long time scale. And by long, we're only talking 100 years or something, or 50 years. I mean, where, where did we start? 1860 is where we, we really start with the fossil fuels making a huge change in, in the economy. Um, you know, we, we're like infants at being able to, to understand what we're doing. Um, so, yeah, using a small amount of fossil fuel, um, we will be okay. Um, and so will our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids and our great great grandkids, etc.